just wanted to say a bit more about myself. I am, um, I've worked in uh, UK government for a number of years. Um, my home department is the Home Office. Home Office deals with, is a huge remit which covers border security, immigration, crime and policing, uh, counter-terrorism. And just now we're very, very busy in terms of we have the Olympics coming in the matter of weeks and part of the Home Office remit is obviously to ensure a safe Olympics. So it's a very, very busy time for us in the Home Office. And um, obviously, my responsibilities there are the delivery of all the services. So the services that, that run the borders, the services that manage all the immigration. Um, so it's, it's a huge task um, to ensure that in the delivery of those services, we have some key challenges um, that I'm going to kind of chat about today. Now, we listened to Frank and um, Paul yesterday, and they gave some really interesting and insightful direction into what CIOs should be thinking about in terms of moving to the third platform. And this is something that was uh, a new terminology for me, the third platform, but something that I will be taking back to the UK. Um, but it, it's, um, they talked about the kind of what you should be thinking about. Today, I kind of want to chat to you about the kind of whys and hows. So why has government decided that it needs to change its ICT landscape? And in terms of the G Cloud program, some of the hows and how we're doing it. So it's about some sharing some learning with you and some sharing some of the challenges that we still have to get over. Um, one of the things that I did want to do was kind of give you some of the facts and figures first. Um, you'll see up there a kind of hashtag of the unacceptable. Um, a predecessor of mine who worked in UK government for many years um, just before he retired, wrote an absolutely sterling speech about what was unacceptable in IT within UK government. And um, he said things like 80% of government IT was delivered by six major suppliers. Okay? And it's referred to the Ogalopi. Um, he talked about, in terms of that, there was unacceptably high costs in terms of the cost of IT to the government there was inflexibility. It was very difficult for us to change. Um, he quoted some examples of things where it took us something like three months to spin up some servers. It cost us 10,000 pounds to change three lines of code. It was very difficult for us to actually stop doing things that we didn't need to do anymore because the way that we had tied ourselves in, both commercially and technically, to these big kind of delivery partners, um, it was difficult to do things and be as agile as we needed to be. So if you do get the chance, Google the unacceptable. There is a lot more in there about why government IT needed to change. Um, one of the other things, the majority, as I've said, of how we do business in the UK is outsourced to um, third parties. Um, but we still have something like 135 ICT professionals in central government, okay? So if you look at central government, it looks at the central government departments such as Home Office, Justice, our Working Pensions, our, our um, Tax Collecting Revenues, our kind of core departments around health policy. Um, but we also have other ICT professionals that work in local government and then we have police IT, and then we have IT out in the wider NHS, and then we have kind of skills and education. So there is a number of IT professionals, and at the time that I got this stat, it was kind of five times more than the number of Google employees. So it's a bit of a startling kind of message to us. Um, we spend approximately 17.8 17 .8 billion pounds in 11-12. Uh, and when we start thinking about that in terms of what we could do and deliver services to the public, that's something like educating three million kids in secondary schools, and it's about 6.2 million patient stays. So it's, it's quite a, a lot of money, um, and uh, we need to spend that money better. We need to spend it on delivering frontline services rather than delivering IT. So, we had a new administration a couple of years ago, 
um, and one of their main priorities is obviously to reduce the deficit, okay? So we have a tough economic landscape. Now, there are 60 million people, or over 60 million people in the UK that we deliver public services to, and at some point in their lives, they're going to touch on a number of those services. So they are absolutely integral to the daily lives of people, and we need to deliver them to them, but we need to deliver faster, cheaper, more flexible services to them. And that was one of the things that this kind of te this economic landscape was presented to us as an opportunity for us to be able to deliver our services in a different way. And, and we took that opportunity and as part of um, the kind of centre of government, we looked at some of the challenges that we faced um, going through um, in terms of how we wanted to change, how we delivered. So one of the big things for us was from a, an external perspective is how do we modernise our public services? As I've said, 60 million people at some point in their life will use them. Um, I think it was Paul that mentioned yesterday about the millennial child um, and the way that we're going to have to change how we deliver services out to this kind of up-and-coming population, as well as still delivering services to um, all parts of the population that might not be so savvy about these types of social media. But one of the things that we have talked, talked about is um, government is moving to what we call digital by default. So we are moving all our services online. So for tax, um, self-assessment tax, for how you apply for visas, uh, for how you do business with government, the move is to put it completely online and there's a huge channel shift towards that. Again, uh, one of the things, and it rhymes with something that was said yesterday, is you shouldn't just take a, an existing process and put it online. You really need to look at how you either simplify the process or change it so that it meets the kind of um, technologies or, or capabilities that you're looking at. And one of the big things, the other big thing that we're doing is um, social media. Now, I don't know if you know that in lots of central government departments, we turn off social media. We don't allow use of Facebook. We don't allow use of Twitter. We don't allow use of various other kind of um, social media, LinkedIn's, that kind of thing. And uh, that's for two reasons. One is our HR people talk about productivity. And if we give access to all these types of um, tools, uh, then the productivity of the organization goes down. And obviously, I think that's a, a really silly reason. And um, I think we really need to get our HR people to rethink how we motivate people to be productive. Um, but the other part is around the security aspects. How do we make it safe to use social media? Um, we're having a lot of uh, interest from the top of government now. We have a new head of the civil service, uh, Sir Bob Kerslake. And Sir Bob is a very keen uh, promoter of social media. And today, when we were talking about civil service reforms, Sir Bob wanted to have a Facebook chat with the whole of the civil service on what was coming out in the civil service reforms, which put a lot of the departments into a spin because we had to go and turn on social media for the day, give people access, and then turn it off at the end. Um, so it is, it is hugely difficult and challenging for us. Um, we have to talk about creating a fairer marketplace. I mentioned to you one of the things about working with the kind of big suppliers that we do, who, don't get me wrong, do hugely great work for us, okay? The challenge that we have is that we're kind of then locked in, okay? And in being locked in to these big suppliers, it's then difficult to get the innovation um, that the kind of smaller suppliers can bring to us. And we've got a huge um, part of the government ICT agenda is to um, introduce more competition, more in innovation. And um, we have this piece of work around what we call small and medium enterprise um, companies. And part of my job is to enable the use of these, this type of company in the delivery of IT services into departments. And I'll talk a bit more about what we did to do that when I talk about the G Cloud piece. Um, 
we need to, doing business with, with government is kind of complex and cumbersome sometimes, especially central government, and we need to look at how we can make that less cumbersome and less complex for people to deal with. Um, we need to look at our public sector provision. How do we do? I mean, what is our core values in the public sector? What is our core business? Um, and one of the things that we are looking at is opening up our kind of um, uh, data and application interfaces um, so that making them public so that businesses out there, or companies out there can use those interfaces to help business, to help the government do better business with the citizen. So for example, with our tax um, collection people, they have opened up their APIs to, um, and made them very public along with their kind of business rules and their testing rules. And so far we've had quite a few companies picked up um, that and made some kind of apps that help businesses uh, work with the tax revenue people in a much better way. So this actually started to prove beneficial just now. And again, we really need to exploit the mobile technologies. Um, I have um, lots of inspectors, lots of tax inspectors, lots of guys out in the border, lots of guys at immigration, who, if they had the right mobile capability, could be far more efficient and productive than they are just now. So when they're going out and, and they're kind of, from an immigration perspective, they, they kind of stop someone, they have to phone back the office and say, are these guys on the watch list? Have they got a proper visa? Have they got this, that, and the next thing? Whereas if they had all that in some sort of smart um, tablet, they could be a lot more efficient and productive than they are. And that is something that we're actually looking at providing to our um, organizations just now. So lots of external challenges. As well as external challenges, we have a lot of internal challenges, okay? There is central government, there is local government, there is police, there is NHS. They all sit in different networks, okay? Um, some of them can't even talk to one another. Um, in central government alone, we kind of sometimes operate as barons in our own right. So if it's not my way, it's not the right way. Um, and at the end of the day, because of the way the accountability and the governance works, there is a lot of power vested in single departments to deliver their business outcomes. Um, and, and that's where the true accountability lies, rather than at the kind of centre. Um, so, we need to do a lot better. We have a shared services agenda in government. Um, and that has had some successes, but we really need to do a lot better in how we improve in terms of sharing and reusing our current capabilities. Um, if I have to talk about another um, system about how we authenticate um, individuals in order to do business with government, um, you should have one authentic authenticating process for doing business with government, the way we currently do it. You could have one for DWP, you could have one for um, our customs people. So it's, it's all about improving how we, we do that. It's about, um, I mean, government is great at publicizing its project failures. Okay, we do have a lot of project successes. We have very many of them, but there is a lot of um, project failures out there which are very, very, uh, well publicised. Um, driving down the cost of goods and services. Now, I don't know if anyone ever saw a, a report that was done by a chap called Sir Philip Green. Sir Philip Green, a huge kind of retail baron, owns multi-billionaire person who owns lots of retail organisations over in the UK, and I think, in fact, he's global. Well, we asked him to do a report for UK government and how we bought things. And one of the things that he came back and said was that it was chaotic because we could buy the same services from the same suppliers at different prices because we all bought as individuals rather than buying as a government whole, okay? So you could, it would cost you, for example, in the Department of Health, 20 pounds for a ream of paper in the inland revenue, it would cost you seven pounds for the same ream of paper. In um, home office, it would cost you 25 pounds for, I mean, I'm just, that, that, that's the, just trying to get the, the message over to you. Those, those aren't the exact figures, please don't publish them anywhere. Um, okay. But it was just about how government doesn't use its buying power as a whole, it tends to do it individually. And, and that was a huge, um, 
piece of work where we then set up what we call the Government Procurement Service. And the Government Procurement Service is all about making sure government is treated as one. Um, again, it's about infrastructure as well. Um, I have, a, I have um, a set of data centres owned by suppliers. Okay, so I, I, I host my data in a supplier's data centre. Um, then the Ministry of Justice hosts their data in the same supplier data centre. And then I'm sure DWP hosts their data in the same. And we build walls between them, okay? <laughs> because we have to separate because of security. And it's just madness. So it's all about how we can consolidate and have better use of our infrastructure. So lots of challenges for us that we needed to address. How are we going to address them? We got a strategy together, as all good people do when they need to address some problems. And the strategy had clear th three clear themes. It was about how we reduce waste, how we, um, using IT, deliver change better, and how we create this common infrastructure, and how we then govern that and make it um, and, and strengthen the governance so that the sum of everything that we were doing kind of added up to the whole because. It was bringing all the government departments together and making sure, as a cross-government, we acted as one rather than acting as a number of individuals. So in terms of reducing waste, um, one of the other challenges that we had is actually understanding what assets and what services we had and used across the whole of government. Now I can tell you exactly what I've got in the Home Office. Um, and I'm sure HMRC can tell you exactly what they've got there. And I'm sure that the Ministry of Justice can tell you what they've got. But could Cabinet Office tell you what the totality of us had? That was difficult. And it was difficult because we don't describe things in the same way. I mean, how I describe my desktop is probably very different from how somebody else describes their desktop. So it was difficult to get that level of information together to snow cross government exactly what we had. But um, we've set up a program addressing that and we're getting a good way through understanding exactly what we've got. Um, there's a huge emphasis to move towards open source. Um, a lot of UK government prides itself on its uniqueness, okay? And we're all very unique, so therefore we have to do things in a very different way, okay? And open source all kind of sounded a bit new age to us, okay? Um, but we have a, a very good program of work in open source, working with our security people, because not a lot of people know that some of our security folks use open source in terms of delivery of their IT. Um, and it was just getting those messages out there that open source is a good thing um, and it should be used in the right way at the right time. And it does help us look at how we open up and how we're more transparent and how we can um, join up and interface across the whole of government a lot more as well. Um, procurement. Procurement in the uh, UK is quite difficult because we have to, I mean, it made me smile yesterday when Paul says, well, you just go and you put your credit card in and you buy it and then you rock up and you've got this hosting of readily available to you. And I really do understand the concept, but there's not many of us in government that have that credit card that we're allowed to put in without going through a number of processes before we do it. Um, and one of the challenges that we had was how do we make procurement a, a lot less complex than it currently is, while still fitting in with the European um, law in terms of how we advertise the services that we require from suppliers. And we've done a lot of work about that in the G Cloud programme, which I'll talk about later on. Um, the other thing that we have um, a big buzzword in government is around agile. And um, we need to do everything more agile now. Now, I'm still looking for the clear um, definition of what Agile means. But for us, Agile is about, it is all about iterating and doing things differently because one of the big challenges that we've had in the past is that by the time you do a requirement for a government system, um, it takes you a year and a half just to get the requirements dotted and T's crossed. And by the time you get to that, you can sure as damn the requirements will have changed. Okay, and it was one of these things about how we bring in iteration and how we develop, how we design and how we deliver our services. And um, you, if you talk across government now, they'll say they've changed their approach about how they do this kind of delivery. And at least 57% of government departments are doing projects in a more agile way. In terms of the 
uh, enabling uh, change. We have created a government digital service um, because every government department has its own kind of website, its own public facing website. Um, every government department does its content management in a different way. Every government department, in terms of doing transactional work with them, does it in a different way. And the government digital service is there to completely revolutionise that um, and to help government departments move more onto doing business online as well. And that's headed up by a guy called Mike Bracken, who came in from Guardian Computing Services and is kind of really revolutionising the way that we're doing our kind of digital services. And again, I think it was Paul that spoke about um, using the, the services from cloud in terms of the infrastructure and the platforms and then developing your own capability to actually then add the value of the, the services that you put on top of that. And that is certainly the way that the, the government digital service is going. Again, I did chat to you a bit about social media. It is something that we know we need to address. It is something that our businesses are clamouring out for. And um, given the direction from the top of the office within civil service, it is something that we should be looking. And we've all been told to give uh, plans to the head of the civil service we'll by the next couple of months, I think it is, to see how we're going to enable social media and all our government departments and how we're going to use it to the benefit of the business. Um, I talked a little bit about strength and governance. Um, we have a very um, committed minister, uh, Francis Maud, who's the minister of the Cabinet Office. And Francis takes a personal interest in the delivery of the cross-government ICT strategy and indeed is one of the key drivers of that strategy. In order to help Francis deliver that, he set up what was called a kind of CIO delivery board. Now, as I say, I work in the Home Office. The CIO delivery board is made up of the key CIOs from the major delivery departments. Okay, so made up from people from home office, from justice, from welfare and pensions, from um, health, uh, from ministry of events, from uh, inland revenue. And the reason behind that was that he felt that in order to engender change, you can't mandate it from the centre. It has to be done by the departments that are actually delivering things. So he set up the CIO delivery board with those key players on it. Um, and he's given each of them accountability for delivering parts of the strategy. Okay? Now, he's also put a lot more strength and governance in about how we spend. So we have a major projects authority that he's put in place, which scrutinises every major project that we want to do across government. Okay? And in terms of spending controls, there is spending, there's a, a, an organisation that looks at everything we do over a certain amount of money. And unless it's complying with what we want to get out of the strategy, then it doesn't get permission to spend. Now, that has uh, saved us quite a bit of money, um, and I'll tell you how much in a minute. But um, it is a different way from how we've used to do business where that kind of power lay within the individual departments rather than the cross-government piece. And one of the things that he's also done is, as I've said, the majority of delivery is done through our suppliers. When Francis first came into Cabinet, he got all the major suppliers in the room um, individually, and he talked to them about how he expected to do business with all the major suppliers, and indeed he extracted some money from them all as well. And it is um, said that we made over a billion's worth of savings in terms of the conversations that uh, Francis was having with all the major suppliers that year. So, very interesting. Um, we have made progress. Some of the progress that we've made is we have published our strategy. Not only have we published the strategy, we do have a clear implementation plan with key accountabilities and deliverables. Um, we have established the CIO delivery board. We have um, put out our strategies on end user devices, which for us is the kind of mobility thing that we talk about. Um, we've put out a strategy on cloud, we put out a strategy on green computing, because green is very, very important to, to us in UK. And we've put out a strategy on capability. What kind of capabilities do we need in the future to deliver IT um, in a different way into government? Um, We've launched what we call our PSN framework, and that's around our connectivity piece. So how do we connect up this myriad of government, that's central government and local government organizations, and how we deliver services out to the public? And we've created what we call a cloud store, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute in the, in the next part of the presentation. We've launched the government digital service, 
And I believe, I think we, the results show that we have a lot more, um, we, we have the ability to, to do business with a lot more suppliers. So 74% of the suppliers that we are now able to do business with sit in that SME market, so those small and medium term enterprises. Um, we have made improvements to the speed of uh, procurement. We have this concept of lean procurement now. And whereas a procurement in UK government could take anything from six months to two years, um, we're now kind of doing it in four to six months. Okay. Um, we have made, um, I mentioned the HMRC example, so we have made government ICT more open to other folks and other organizations so that they can help us deliver some business value. Um, we have reduced the size and complexity of our projects and we now manage our risks much better across government. And we made savings of 159.6 million on our contracts during the financial year as part of the controls that we put in in terms of governance. So that's a bit of the kind of why we did what we did and some of the, the um, results we've had, but we do still have some further challenges. We have to continue to implement the strategy. Okay, we're at the very beginning, we've just done our first year. Um, the strategy has a number of key strands, a number of key delivery departments delivering against those strands. We have a job to make sure that the sum of all these strands ups, adds up to the whole of the strategy. And that's quite difficult across the kind of complexity um, of what we're doing. Um, and we need to kind of map more dependencies across each of these, these programs. Um, I talked about the CIO delivery board. Now that's kind of the six key CIOs in government. In central government, you've probably got between 20 and 25 CIOs across the other government departments as well. We need to do a lot more about bringing that CIO community in. We've got all the CIOs out in the public sector, all the CIOs out in the place and out the NHS as well. So we need to kind of build a broader engagement with uh, the wider CIO community. Um, Cross-government resourcing issues. Now, I talked about that we had a lot of people, okay? But do we have a load of the right people? Um, and that's part of the capability piece that we're looking at. Um, we've also, in terms of I don't know if you know that, but in UK government, nobody can earn more than the Prime Minister. Now, you would think that would be okay, wouldn't you? Because the Prime Minister earns a reasonable amount. But in terms of getting some of the key innovators and some of the key people who can make change happen, it is sometimes difficult to get those folks in because those folks do expect a little bit more than the Prime Minister earns as well. So we have some challenges there. Um, we have done a lot with the, 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 the industry, a lot with our suppliers, and we need to continue to do that. And um, as I say, we've done the first year of the strategy and, and we have quite, some quite successes. And we had an independent review of the strategy done by our audit folks as well. And one of the things that they brought up was that um, we don't really have a robust process for measuring success, okay? Because somebody said to me, as part of my cloud piece, I have to save so many millions, okay? Um, how am I going to ensure that I do that? Um, as the other parts, how do I know how many government departments or local government departments are going to take up open source? How do I really know that we are improving our kind of timescales and our success rate in delivering projects? And although we have some key indicators in how to measure that, I think what we really need to do is be, have some more robust methodologies in, in doing that so that we can absolutely see um, with clear evidence the kind of successes that we have made. So, so what about G Cloud? Okay. As I said, my, um, my home department is the home office. I've worked in many government departments over my years. Um, I've worked from being a project uh, programmer. I've worked through all the disciplines. I've worked through where we delivered services in-house, right through to what we called market testing, right through to outsourcing, right through to business processing, outsourcing, so outsourcing the whole business. Um, so I've kind of got a lot of experience of all the different ways that we've delivered IT. And uh, 
I must say, I don't think we've ever really got it right. Um, and one of the, I was having a conversation with uh, some of the guys from, in fact, it was Vivek Kundra, I think, who used to be the CIO of the federal government at the time in, in the USA. And one of the things I said when going through this kind of journey that we're going through just now, that part of the thing that we've done is we've not enabled choice, okay? We've either locked ourselves in from a technology perspective, we've locked ourselves in from a commercial perspective, or we haven't been able to have the capabilities ourselves to deliver properly, okay? So whatever we do going forward, we really need to make sure that people have the choice to deliver IT in the way that best suits their business, okay? So that's why I was really keen to take up the G Cloud Program Director job. Now, one of the things that um, government is also doing is that for all the key program director jobs in terms of the strategy, they have to sit in big delivery departments and understand big delivery challenges, okay? They have to have worked with suppliers, um, they have to have worked with kind of the, 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 the marketplace, the, they have to have worked with the key stakeholders in terms of who we have to deliver business to, okay? Now, I was keen to take up this role because I seen it as a way that government really could change how it delivered, but change in such a way that it didn't constrain us from making different choices six months, one year, two years down the line. Um, so that's what we've tried to aim to do as part of our G Cloud journey, which I'll talk a bit now. That's our ICT strategy on a page, and you'll see there all the different work streams and um, all the different departments. But the reason for that slide is I just wanted to talk about some of the four key planks for what we call common infrastructure. And common infrastructure is cloud, it's PSN, which is about how we all connect ourselves. It's about um, end user devices and mobility. And it's about um, what we call government hosting. Because we did talk yesterday about legacy um, and how do we look at our legacy. Okay? And one of the things that people are very clear about is that maybe cloud isn't going to be the automatic answer to a legacy at this point in time, but what we need to do is make sure from a government UK perspective is that we have a hosting capability, which is cloud in any other word, but can deal with what we call the kind of heavy lift and shift. Um, so the other part of that is the government hosting capability. So that is our strategy. As I say, I'm program director for the G Cloud Vision, uh, sorry, for G Cloud, and um, Again, this is not news to anybody, okay? But it is very much for UK government moving from customization to commodity. We are used to, in both central and local government, to building things to our own specifications. It has to be my way. I have a specific need. I am unique. You do not understand, okay? And trying to move people from that kind of customization to a commodity way of doing business is one of the things that the G Cloud is um, one of our kind of key visions. Um, when G Cloud first started, G Cloud first started in UK government about three years ago. And about that time, we were talking about building a government cloud. And we put this business case together, and we had all the kind of might of industry behind us, OK? And we came out with this horrendous business case for many, 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 many millions of pounds <laughs> to build a government cloud. Now, that wasn't really going to go anywhere. Um, and by the time we put it together, we knew that just wasn't the way that we should be looking at cloud. We should really be looking at public cloud first, because it's looking at public cloud first that we'll be able to deliver the savings and the choice that we need in terms of these services available um, to government. So it very much is a public cloud first strategy. It is pay as you go. Paul mentioned pay as you go, scale up, scale down, cost efficient. And one of the things that we also talk about is friction free. We've talked about kind of the gravity of data, okay, and we talk about big data. And I say data and not data. Okay. Um, but one of the things that we did want to talk about was friction free, because the biggest challenge to us is how do we move our data around? And one of the things that we've said in G Cloud is that if we want to, because one of the strap lines for G Cloud is, Easy to enter, easy to use, easy to exit, 
Okay? And then the easy to exit part is how do you move your data from one service to the other. And one of the things that we've said to our G Cloud suppliers is that you must tell us up front how that can happen, okay, what the cost of it is, what the activities involved are, before we actually go and buy your service. So friction-free is very important to us. I once made the mistake of calling it fiction-free, and uh, I was roundly... Um, Anyway, the other thing is Assure and Accredit. Okay, now, as I've said, we have the uh, ability in government to buy the same thing for the same supplier and Assure it and Accredit it. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, inefficient, costly, and one of the things that we want to do with cloud is we want to do Assure once, Accredit once, and then reuse, reuse, and reuse. And Assure and Accredit mean different things to us. Assure is about are you somebody that we can do business with? Um, do you have a service that we want? Does the kind of service say what it does on the tin? It's a kind of high level piece. A credit is all about the actual and can we use it at the kind of business impact levels in terms of security that we need to do as well. And I'll talk a bit more about the accreditation in a minute. So one of the, some of the things that we needed to think about as we went into the programme, because the programme's been live in its new format for about a year now, was we had to look at how we did things differently, okay? Um, it's about not replicating business processes um, in this kind of new way of delivering. Um, and that's a kind of different mindset from government departments in terms of how they want to, to do stuff. Um, so, we've got a, a kind of program that's talking to businesses about how they can deliver their business in different ways, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. We have to enable access to low-cost commoditized services, and that was a huge piece of work for us. Um, and part of that was encouraging this whole kind of small and medium enterprise people to come and do business with us, and also to talk to what we call emerging suppliers. And my definition of emerging supplier is probably different from, I think, what Mike's was yesterday. Um, our definition of emerging in UK government is Amazon and Google <laughs> and <laughs> the big players that you get in most places but who don't normally kind of do business with, with UK government and it was about how we actually wanted to create a competitive marketplace because I said we did have this concept of supplier lock-in which meant the competition wasn't really there. So what did we do? Okay. First of all, we defined what we meant by our cloud-based services, okay? So we have infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, and some specialist cloud services. One of the things that really um, excited me about when we got the software as a service, just the amount of services that suppliers were bringing to the table in all sorts of categories. It wasn't just email, collaboration, um, your kind of document management, your productivity. Okay, there was all sorts of things like patient records, um, lots of stuff in health and well-being, lots of stuff on payroll, a whole host of services. So we were really pleased to see the amount of kind of um, innovation that was coming forward there. And then the fourth lot is specialist cloud services. Now that for us was lots of people are going to need help from moving from the old way of doing business into the new way of doing business. How do I make sure that there's people there to help them? And that's the kind of people that sit in specialist cloud services. So it's guys that can do service integration um, in a, a cloud environment. It's about the chaps that can help you transition from old to new. And again, we have very, very strong and key players in that lot as well. So we created these four lots. Um, as part of the program, one of the things that we did, and this is how the Home Office became involved originally, we set up what we called Foundation Delivery Partners. And Foundation Delivery Partners were there to actually turn something, a concept, into something tangible. Okay, because there's no point, and one of the big things about going out in government is about, we all have theories, we all have concepts, we all have strategies, but we have, do we have something that you can kind of feel in touch, something that's real. And part of the Home Office's role was in infrastructure and platform as a service to actually turn them into tangible services. And that's how we get involved in the first place. Um, so we did that first. 
We then obviously looked at our kind of um, how do we ensure, because part of this is about how everything kind of plugs and plays together. And in order to do that, we need to have kind of common standards, um, both from a technical and a commercial perspective. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is we want to work out loud. One of the key philosophies of cloud is we iterate, we do things um, in kind of six monthly cycles and we look for feedback from both the industry and our buying community about everything we do. So we call the concept working out loud and we kind of blog and we tweet and we put things out there and we ask you for opinions, we get those opinions back and then we work on them. Okay? Everything we do is open and transparent. Uh, and that's one of the kind of key changes for doing business with a lot of our new um, supply community. Federated service management. Um, the big, one of the big challenges for us in government is that we've worked with service integrators for the last 10 years. So we have the guys that do all this for us, how they do the systems integration how we manage the kind of commercial integration with them subbing to all the kind of telcos and all the third parties that we need to do business with. Um, we have people who want, and as, as again, I, I can't remember, it was Frank or Paul said, we want to move to this new delivery method, but people still want the same SLAs and they still want the same security standards. And the kind of whole federated service management piece is about how do we do service management in this new world? And we're busy working with the industry to think about how we can have some methodologies and some processes around that as well. Um, governance and authority. As I say, I work in the programme just now. The programme will probably have a two-year life cycle. At the end of that programme, this will become business as usual, and we need to have the governance there to make sure that it continues as, continues as a business as usual function. Um, let, let me talk a bit about commercial vehicles. I don't know if people here are familiar with the concept of frameworks and buying from frameworks, and, um, especially as it relates to government. Well, part of our kind of um, legal compliance piece about how we buy is we have to go through the European journals and we have to say that we have these services that we want to buy and it goes out across the whole of Europe. Um, and some of the things we do, in, as well as doing kind of one-to-one -one procurements, we, we, we kind of, when I say one-to-one, -one, I don't mean with one supplier, I mean it's an open procurement where we deal with maybe three or four suppliers. But the other thing we do is we put frameworks in place. And a framework is a list of suppliers that we've gone through a kind of set of terms and conditions with that we can draw off on those services. Now, the way it currently works is that we put out the UG uh, advert, a number of suppliers um, express their interest. We go through a whole shortlisting process. We set a framework up for four years. A number of people got on that framework. And then when we come to buy from services from you, we do another little mini procurement again amongst three or four people on the framework. Not terribly efficient. Those guys are on the framework for four years. Those services at the beginning of the four years, is that still the same services I need as at the end of the four years? How do I get new services on it? How do I get services off it that I don't need anymore? Okay, so that was the way that we kind of currently done business. I'm glad to say with cloud, we've completely changed because one of the things that I was really determined that we did was this whole choice thing. So it's the ability to roll services and suppliers onto the framework as we need them. And we've kind of done a bit of groundbreaking stuff here in UK government um, where we've set up this framework and we refresh it every three to six months so that new suppliers, new services can come on and off the framework. So that's one of the things that we've done. The second thing that we've done is that in order to do business with uh, government, I'd probably have given you about four or 500 pages worth of terms and conditions and schedules and things that you had to do, okay? And you would have to read through those four or 500 pages and you'd have to respond accordingly and sign up, okay? Trying to do business like that with small and medium enterprises is just not feasible, okay? So what we did is we took those three, 400 pages and we put them down to 20, 20 of the key things that from a legal compliance perspective that we had to do, so things like freedom of information, um, about information commissioner, how we protect our data, um, those were the key things that we kept um, and we've been able to do business with lots more suppliers because it has become less complex, less difficult for um, smaller companies to do business with us now. And the other thing that we, we've done is we've put a catalogue in place, and so we've built what we call the cloud store. 
And the cloud store is their kind of attempt at a, an app store of some sort. But what it is, it's there to talk about all the different services that we have on the cloud store and how you can compare, contrast, access them easily. And if you do want to buy for some government, it is that click right through to how you actually buy from a government procurement side. So that's the kind of things that we've done. Okay. Um, we had our first um, framework ready by October last year. Now, as I said, it took us less than six months to put this framework together, which was a huge, huge achievement. We did simplify the procurement process somewhat, um, and it is the only framework of its type in UK government that has that amount of suppliers on it. So it has over 250 suppliers offering 1,700 services Okay, of which 74% of that supply base is small and medium enterprises. It is the first in UK government. Okay. Now, as I said, our challenge was to listen to the supply community and act on feedback. So we put our second procurement out just on the 24th of May there. Okay. We've already received 244, and I think it's gone up since I last put these slides together. Okay, so again, I know that I've been talking to more people out there in the industry who had said to me, well, we didn't come in in the first part of the framework because we wanted to see what it was going to be like, um, but they're now coming in in the second iteration of the framework. Okay, some of the differences of, of the framework that we're doing here is that, um, as I said, I wanted to refresh the framework every three to six months. Some of our buying community get a bit worried about the fact you've got a three to six month framework. Okay, so we've elongated it to 12 months rather than six months, but that won't stop me refreshing at three monthly intervals. Okay, um, we had call off contracts before that could run up to one year um, because there is a, a kind of remit from the centre, from Francis Maud, that says we shouldn't be letting contracts bigger than a year anyway or we shouldn't be letting contracts for uh, more than a certain amount of money. Um, so we took that to heart. Again, some of our buying community, not our supply community, but our buying community, were a bit challenged with that, so we've put it to 24 months. Um, in that framework, you could have bought services up to 60 million pounds. We've now increased that to 100 million pounds. So that's some of the differences. The next iteration of the framework will be and about another three to six months, but I'm not giving you a date yet. Okay. Um, one of the things, and I, I can't actually get access to the cloud store, but one of the things that we did build is we did build this cloud store. First iteration of the cloud store went out when we put framework one out. Second iteration went out last month. Um, and again, the cloud store, if you click on it, it does give you all the services, the description of the services, the level of assurance on there. Um, and in the way that we're working, which is completely transparent, it will give you the price of all the services as well. So not only will the buying community be able to see the cost of the service, but the suppliers will also be able to see the cost of all their services as well. So it has, um, it has caused some conversations out there in the supply community, but I must say all our suppliers are responding really well and really kind of uh, enjoying the competition. Um, I'll give you the URL for the cloud store so that when you kind of want to log on, you can have a look and see it. And again, it's one of these things that we want constant feedback on because we want to improve it. We want to start putting things like ratings on it. So kind of not like a trip advisor, but something like that where people who use the services can say, yeah, we found the service did exactly what it said. It was really good. It wasn't as good as I was expecting it to be. So that's all coming out in the next iteration of cloud store. Um, Accreditation, okay? Now, people keep saying to me, security is a challenge, and they keep saying to me there is, um, it can be resolved, but nobody's told me actually how yet, okay? Um, and accreditation, security has always been difficult, okay? Don't, it's, it's never been an easy topic, 
and even within their current projects and the way we currently do business, security is still something which we have to address and, and, and it is a, is, is a difficult subject. One of the things that we want to do is we want to start looking at pan-government accreditation because again, different departments have their own accreditors. We all have the same guidance and the same rules, but we all do it in, we all interpret that guidance and interpret that rules to meet our particular needs. So one of the things that we want to do in, in working with our colleagues at um, GCHQ, which is our government communications headquarters, which are responsible for all the kind of security standards, is to look at how we do pan-government accreditation of all these services, okay? So we have a number of services that is going through that accreditation just now. And that means that once it's accredited, you get your badge, it's on the cloud store, and people seeing that you've got that accreditation badge on the cloud store, um, feel a bit more comfortable from a security perspective and actually doing business with you. So we're working through, we're working through something that I think between 30 and 40 um, suppliers just now on accrediting their services and we will work through the majority of them. As I say, assurance, we just do that basic level. Before, where we would have taken up references, we will have done all sorts of things to assure the services. This is about light touch assurance because your um, credibility, your assurance will come by how many people use you and how many people actually then report back to whether the service was satisfactory or not. In the first two and a half months, okay, we've sold about half a million pounds through the, the framework. Okay? Now, my government procurement colleague, John Collington, who's the head of the government procurement services, took me aside and said, Denise, that's a shocking that's a shocking, okay, only, only half a million in two and a half months. Um, to other people, it was a great achievement because this is a brand new way of doing business in central government and in the first 10 weeks of a framework, it was actually quite an achievement to have that amount of money flowing through it. Now, I know since then, okay, that we have sold much more through the framework, um, but I can't reveal those figures until I get them um, approved by our government procurement people, but we have sold a significant amount more. Okay. One of the, the, the big challenges for us, as I've said, and this maybe relates to the half a million, is I've got a supply community now there that is eager to do business with us, who have responded absolutely well, okay, who are already talking to me about how the, uh, their, the demand on them has increased because of the cloud store. Um, I have a buy community, and when I talk about my buy community, I talk about central government, local government, police, I, uh, NHS, uh, third sector, which is charities, education, universities, okay? Some who are more um, enthusiastic about the whole cloud journey and taking up the services than others. And one of the jobs that I have is to go out there amongst the buy community and tell them all about cloud, what it is and how it will help their business. And this is what we call propagation, okay? And propagation to us is about being transparent, iterating how we do things, communicating. We have to communicate both with our supply and our buy community. And the way we do that is that we blog and we tweet uh, and we blog and tweet in a way that's unusual in government because I have 270 suppliers that I need to talk to on a regular basis. I can't have them in my office every day in the way that I would when I used to talk to the big SIs. So we were out there blogging, we're out there, um, as I say, tweeting constantly about what it is cloud is all about, what we're doing, um, what help we can give them, what help we need from them. Um, we're currently, as I've said, and the reason that I know we've sold a lot more through Cloud Store is we're currently working with 50 public sector organisations just now. Um, we have the concept of, the, we have this box called Ask Mike. <laughs> it just happens to be that Mike's one of the guys on the programme and he, he kills me every time um, I talk about Ask Mike because he gets a whole flood of emails. Um, and it's all about people asking how can cloud help me? What do I need to do to get access to it? How do I work it? What are the problems? How do I do service management? What about security? Um, and we're currently working with 50 public sector people through them buying something through the cloud services. We're a small team in the G Cloud program. Um, and one of the things that we know we need to do is actually to look at building communities, okay? We need to build communities of buying people. Um, we need to um, 
get a kind of federated approach to getting the message out there. We need to get champions out in the bi community to actually start taking the message out further. Um, and we're working in how we do those, building those communities. One of the other things that we're doing is we want to get the business and the supply community much together. So we're talking about what we call supplier expos, where we have a, a theme around a business problem. Um, and then we get some suppliers in who have got responses to those business problems and some of the business people to see how we can all do business together. Um, the other thing that we're doing, and again, I think, I don't know whether it's Frank or Paul touched on it yesterday, a lot of suppliers are getting together to explore how they can mutually bring an end-to-end -end service to us. So a lot of the SaaS providers are talking to the IaaS and PaaS providers about how they can actually start delivering services back in to, to government in a kind of end-to-end -end way, which again is really good. Um, we've got a whole thing we're doing on consultancy and education. We're talking about G-Cloud boot camps. Um, and we, we have this thing in, down there called BiCamp, and I'm just about to instigate BiCamp the tour, where we're going to go around the whole of the UK, and that's then talking to people in organisations who are buying um, responsibilities about how they use the cloud, what, when they should be using the cloud, all that kind of stuff as well. So we have a number of events where we talk about apply camps, whereas we've just had one um, a few weeks ago where we actually talked to the supply community about how they actually... Um, the process of getting on Cloud Store, because a number of these organizations have never done business with government before. So we have webinars, we have um, little sessions where they come in and we talk them through the process, talk them how to do it. Um, we have the buy camps, which is similar for users, and then we have the accredit camps, and that's to talk about security. And it's about helping um, suppliers who have never again worked with business to work through some of the security challenges and how they need to um, work with pan-government accreditation on that. So I think I'm going well over my time, sorry. Um, so what are our challenges? Big one, culture and behaviour, okay? Changing the culture, because this is not about technology, as was said yesterday. I think the technology uh, is there to enable us to do things. This is about culture and behaviour out in our organisations. Um, it's about how do we move from custom to commodity. Uh, which is a difficult th concept for some people, is continuing to support the supply organisations uh, in terms of how they do business with government, um, maintaining the programme momentum. Because um, again, we're constantly learning as we go through the programme as well, because I'm very, very keen that we don't get into that mindset of what we're doing just now is absolutely the best and we're the greatest and all that kind of stuff. It's not about that. It's about how do we continue to learn as well through this process? How do we continue to bring new ideas to this process? And some of the things that we're talking about is um, cloud store as being becoming the gov store so that you'll buy most of your services through the gov store. So things like for connectivity as well, things like for your end user devices, all that kind of stuff. So we're talking about kind of innovating the cloud store. Um, so we're always keen to, to, to make sure that we're not kind of sitting thinking we've done all the kind of strategic thinking there. Um, integration across the stands of the strategy. Again, our end user devices people, our people who are dealing with connectivity, our government hosting people. It's about how do we make sure that we're all joined up and aligned? How do we make sure that we don't confuse both the buy and supply community if we're delivering similar services or if there's gaps in services? It's about how we all work together on that one. Um, it's about how we help departments um, transition from the old to the new, how we get them to do this integration, because government departments aren't used to doing their own service and systems integration, so it's how we help them do that as well. And then again, the one that's forever there, it's about how we, in a, a commodity services world, do we rationalise how we do security as well. So, I think that was all I had to say. So that's just sharing our journey, where we've got to, we haven't got it all sorted. We've still got some further challenges, but I think we have had some key successes and I'm quite excited about continuing this journey.